Lord, we proclaim that you are our source. You are our Father source. The one who gives us all things, including fruits, including everything that bears fruit in us. We release together as one body, as a community of Jesus Christ, who is founded on the kingdom and a community who lives through forgiveness, who rules not like the world rules, not like the bullies of the world, but who rules through the domain of Christ. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. It's only one fruit. It has nine different things. It looks nine different ways, but it's one fruit. Lord, we release the encouragement of God right now in the heart of those who have given up hope, who have left that life of prayer and intercession and weeping and travailing before you and said, that's hopeless. I've been pruned. The places where I used to bear fruits have been cut off. It seems like I shrunk. It seems like it's even worse than before I prayed. Lord, we declare together right now with one voice that Jesus, you are healing the wounds of those who are dried. And you are releasing hope. You are unveiling new ways for the adoption, for the fruits, for the fruits in, in, in these people's lives. Where they are hopeless, there is hope. And you declare it today. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Thank you, Jesus. We rejoice because you are good. You are good. You're always good. Lord, we, we, we claim this word that in the last days, man will fear God, not because of calamities, not because of judgments, because of his goodness. You look it up. We thank you, Lord, that man will fear you because of your goodness. And we are here to declare your goodness for those who are hopeless among us. You breathe new life and new hope. We thank you, Lord. I bless you. I thank you that you affection us this morning. And we kiss you with the kisses of our mouth. We worship you. That's another word for it. We affection you. Your tender love. Thank you, Lord, for your presence right now that is coming at a different level even to rest upon us. We bless you. May your light shine on us, especially those who are hopeless. Flood them, Jesus, with a hope that is not born of this world. With what you say, Jesus, Eske no sen. My kingdom doesn't grow from this world. It is for this world, but it doesn't grow from this world. And this hope doesn't grow here, but it is for here. And it comes from heaven. And we ask for that open heaven on these people. You are Bel Perizim, the God of breakthrough. We receive it. Amen. Amen. Stay in this posture. I want to pray for some birthing also, that you would have spiritual sons and daughters. And I am also going to pray for the birthing of churches across this region, in particular among the rodeo cowboy culture. Right, Britt? And Tori and Peavy and Jennifer. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask right now, give us sons. Give us daughters in the spirit, Lord, in this family. Give us new birth, not only in the natural. And I pray for Diana and Bob's grandchildren. I, pray, I want grandchildren for our family. I want natural children, but we want spiritual children. Release spiritual children, Lord. And now we pray for the birthing across the region for new churches. We pray for a birthing of, church, of a church in Fort Collins, Loveland area. 
We pray for the birthing of a church, Lord, in Cheyenne area. We pray for a birthing in Rock Springs, in Rollins, in Pinedale. Our church birthed in Jackson Hole, Lord. More churches in El Paso and Juarez. Lord, we pray for the birthing of apostolic, prophetic church families that continue to birth more families. Church planting churches that sweep the nation with signs, wonders, and miracles. Come, Lord. We pray it today in this humble place, in this, in this foundational place as a church planting church. We pray for fruitfulness. Lord, I want to honor those that have been in this city faithfully praying and laboring before you, Lord. I thank you for the laborers and send more. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Okay. Open your Bibles. To Matthew, chapter 6. We're still at a very new phase of our church plant here in Laramie. And... Um, it's our responsibility, that's the Basujas and the Johnses, to help continue to lay foundations, biblical foundations, that are critical in building a valid and viable kingdom family in this region that establishes more churches. We're still at that foundation building phase of our life together, trying to get the vision clear, trying to get the values clear, trying to get the culture right, trying to get the strategies intact. You know, the twos and threes where we make disciples, we help disciple one another. The, the missional kingdom families where we become a family that reaches out to the lost. You know, these basic strategies that, God is, that are biblical, that God has given to us. So we're still at that phase. But we've had a very serious breakthrough when we identified Josh and Amy, Andrew and Jessica and Bob and Diana as core leadership and those three men as elders in this local church. That was a very big step forward in the forming of this local church. And then Josh is on deck being trained to be the lead elder of this church planting church. And uh, this is a very, very dynamic time. So when you're coming into a very infant, a church at its infancy, we're very young, and um, we're still at the phase of everybody needing to be on the same page in unity around how God brings his kingdom to earth. So isn't that an exciting thing to be in the, at the front end of something new like this, and be a pioneer? And we're sorry for the chill in the air, but we just felt like for the word, we got to kind of Get the rocket jets from, from blowing, and then we'll get it back on soon. Well, part of those foundations of walking with Jesus involves our economics. It involves living in the supernatural realm of heaven around the topic of money. It's a very exciting conversation. This is not, you're not going to feel berated or beat up by the time we're done. You're going to feel wooed and encouraged because I'm not trying to get you know, anything out of your pocketbook and into some you know, ministry. This is about how you live in the supernatural before God. We're going to talk about God, money, and supernatural stewardship. And Janet, at the end of our time today, is going to get your names and email addresses, if you're new here, so I can email you these notes as well as we're going to email to you two sets of documents that will help you put your finances in order. I have brought with me a, a basically a prototype budget and put it over there on the table, a kingdom budget for you to begin to work with the Lord and watch God bless you and move in your life in this area. So we're talking now again about an apostolic foundations in the way we relate with God around the topic of finances. So let's go to um, Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to start at verse 19. Okay? Again, don't be nervous. 
People think, oh, money, oh, my goodness, this is going to be awful. No, it's not. It's going to be awesome. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other, You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life. Beloved, the soul that's in you was never made for worry or anxiety. It was always meant to prosper in the atmosphere of faith. Do not worry about your life. Let's just all say that. Do not worry about your life. What you will eat or drink. Or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, Oh my gosh, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Glory to God. Glory to God. All right. Beloved, God and money, faith and finances are inseparable. In other words, how you relate to God will determine how you relate to money. And how you relate to money will determine how you relate to God. Is that true? Does that make sense? Money and God, you cannot separate these two. They're they're very, very close. And that's why Jesus talked as much as, as, as second to the kingdom, he talked more about money than any other topic. Because it had such it has such power in it, it has such force in it. Two God and money are two all-consuming forces. Why is money so forceful? Is because it is a symbol and a token of what will meet our security needs, our survival needs, our wants and desires. It's folded life. It has the capacity to get us what we need to survive and live, let alone have fun with. So money is a force there's an energy around it. That's why we go after it with such, en- with such focus and such deliberateness. Money is a huge element in life. It's a, it's, we use it to transact business to get, you know, to trade and barter. It's a, it's a barter of exchange. Without that symbol, without that token, whether it's paper, you know, it's paper, or whether it's coinage, or whether it's properties, whatever, those things are symbols and tokens that get us what we need. They're the basis of our survival. And so the Lord is saying, 
you can either trust in this human created token, this human created symbol that, that gets you what you need, or you can go to an invisible God that overrides all reality and trust in Him. But you can't do both at the same time. You, you, can't, you can't really give yourself over to this force and this energy called money and hold on to it and think about it and wonder about it and get it and possess it and be nervous about it and not be able to let it go and live under that poverty spirit. You can't, you can't be wooed by money and live in the freedom of the supernatural provider God, the source of all life. Does this make any sense? If you're going to come into the kingdom and underneath God, there are four major things in your life that have to be turned over to him. That's other people. And so God says, hate them as in comparison to loving me. You've got to turn over people. You've got to turn over property. You've got to turn over time. And finally, and most importantly, really, you've got to turn over money. You've got to turn over money. Because it stops being yours. You stop being over it and control of it. You now become a steward of it, a manager of it. So you, you really haven't come into, into Christ and Christ into you if you haven't dealt with the topic of money, as we're going to see in a minute. There's no true conversion into faith outside of the issue of economics. In fact, you'll see in a minute, I'm going to show you that there is no true conversion in the Bible that doesn't involve people's money. It always, God always will go for your pocketbook because your pocketbook is connected to your heart. And he knows that. It's the basis of what you trust. And he goes, I know, I know, I know that you've been operating on the world systems. You've been, you've been accumulating money, going after money, you know, and I know how much you need it. Now give it to me. Give me your money. Give me your money. Oh, give me your money. Oh! And right there, you've got, the, you've got literally a civil war going on inside. Because if I give you my money, I give over my control. I give over my survival. I give over my significance, my security, my safety. How am I going to eat? Oh, my God, how am I going to dress? How am I going to get transported? How am I going to live in the future? How am I going to feed my family? How am I going to be sheltered in the house? Oh, my God, I want your money, says the Lord. Why? Because he's broke? Like, oh, gee, poor old God, he just needs what you have. You've really... No, because he wants you. He wants you to experience his fathering provision, his supernatural life. And you can't experience that if you still are large and in charge. You can't. Those two worlds will not coexist. You can't love mammon. You can't love money. You can't bank on it and experience the supernatural reality of an unseen God. It's impossible. If you're still propping yourself up internally and externally by being in control of your money, you have not been fully experienced the fullness of being born again and moved in the Spirit. Now, that's not condemnation. That's not to beat you up. That's just to say the American church has ripped you off and created an alternative called the Christian religion. And this alternative of the Christian religion says you can remain in control and bring God in as you wish, when you wish, on the level and the areas that don't matter all that much. You need some tingles. You need some goosebumps. You need some inspiration. You need some friends. Bring in God. You're in trouble, you're desperate, bring in God. But in terms of operating 
fully under his provision in his life, he's not on call to be our celestial Santa Claus that we just like, whoop, you know? Our little, you know, taxi driver in the sky who comes when we need a lift. Otherwise, I'm fine, you know, I'm, it's cool, I got this one, Lord. Stand down. And we're not going to be an apostolic people, a prophetic people. By that I mean sent out ones under the, the power and the glory and the love of God. If this issue hasn't been wrestled down in the spirit realm, in our hearts as a family. And we haven't talked about it, unfortunately. And so, man, as we've been praying over the last couple months... I mean, Amy especially. Amy really has a prophetic voice in our family. She goes, we've got to address this issue, particularly among the millennials in our family. They have not been, those that are, I'll just say this, those that are under 40. How many does that include? And in the spirit, since I'm under 40, I'm raising my hand. (laughs) Thank you very much. If you're under 40, you've probably only heard this topic in a way that you've been berated or you've been found guilty or shamed, you know, you're just stealing from God. What's your problem? I mean, that is not the spirit of where we're at today. I want to, on behalf of heaven, pull you into a world of faith where you watch God move in the places that it counts most. Your pocketbook, your provision, your finances, the supernatural invasions of God in your life. You can't know this if you're still retaining control. Now, I'll give you a word picture. We were visiting San Diego, and um, we pull into this parking lot, and I I couldn't see the beach. So we start kind of walking through the sand and the dunes, and all of a sudden, up we come to a cliff. I mean, a sheer cliff that had to be like 200 feet high, maybe 300 feet high. A sheer cliff, and down below was another beach. And so I looked over, and I saw, just down the way, about, again, about four or five hundred yards, I saw a bunch of crazy people with hang gliders. And I went, this is freaky. I got to see this, Janet. So we go over there, we walk there, and these crazy guys and gals strapped on these hang gliders, these flimsy little kites, and they would, like, literally get back about 10 feet, and they would just go, whoosh, 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 boom, and then they'd just explode off the cliff, hoping to God that the wind didn't stop. <laughs> and suddenly, poof, that wind just caught that sail, and it just lifted them up, and then they just, I mean, cruise. They'd catch thermals, and they go higher and higher and higher and higher, and just kind of cruise around. And I went, this is what I was made for. Janet, can I have one? She goes, not on your life. You kamikaze crazy man. No way. I said, oh, please, please, please. She goes, no. But I've never forgotten that word picture. These guys exploded from the world of gravity to the world of aerodynamics in a split second. And there is no in-between you know what I'm saying? You can't hang glide and keep one toe on the, on the, you know, on the cliff. That's like spastic. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it. Because the only way you're going to know the power of the wind, the power of another realm, is if you leap. There is no two, it's not like two, there's only two options. Not, there's not a third option. Now, the Christian religion creates option three. You just give a little bit, you know, it's going to sting a little bit, but you just give a little bit, but you're still riding on the world of gravity. You're still riding in control. You haven't been released. You haven't jumped into the arms of the Father. And that's what Jesus is teaching. You've got to jump. You can't live in both worlds at the same time. You can't love mammon and hold on to mammon and love it and then love God at the same time. Any questions about this? So when Jesus comes to talk to somebody, everybody, it's going to get down to money. Your money or your life. And he's not holding a gun to your head. 
He's saying your money or your life, your eternal life, the quality of your life, your eternal kingdom reality, your money or your life. Now, again, no gun. But he's going, please let me show you. Please let me prove. Please come on into this supernatural world where the avionics really work. Come on. I don't know. You know the economy. You know the bozos in Washington. You know, this isn't good. This is not a time to get crazy for Jesus. Really? Like there was ever a time to get crazy for Jesus? So, Jesus, this rich young ruler comes up. He goes, what must I do to be saved? And the Lord gives him the basic pat answer, just testing his heart. You know, love God, love people. He goes, ah, come on, give it to me, really. What do I need? What, what do I need to do in order to get in the world you're living in of signs and wonders and miracles where the obvious fruit of the Spirit, wisdom of the Spirit, and power of the Spirit are on your life. What do I need to do to get into your realm? Because your realm is not like these Pharisee realms. They're giving out of religious duty. I, he didn't bring that up, but they're, they're just living in these, this script of keeping rules. I can tell you have an intimacy with God as a son. I can tell you're moving in the spirit world by the Holy Spirit. What do I need to do to get that saved? And Jesus goes, oh, oh, well, if if that's saved, if that's how saved you want to be, then give everything away. In your case, give everything away. And he uses the word everything. Everything. Give it away. Give it to the poor, follow me, and you'll be in for an eternal party, the likes of which you never thought. And he didn't tell him that in his back pocket he has the capacity to go find a fish and have the fish cough up gold coins. Like, dude, I can, I can come up with money. He, Jesus didn't say, come and give all your money to me and follow me. He says, give it to the poor, because he didn't want that guy being suspicious of his motives, even though they did have a war chest. He said, give it to the poor, follow me. Jesus is like going, do you understand? I'm the God of the tithe. I'm the God of, of the coinage. I'm the God of the money. There is no problem. If we've got to multiply this stuff, it's no problem. I'm after your heart, and you've got a God standing between me and you, and I want that idol done with. Sever that idol so that you can experience me as a God that's the real one true God that I am. Sever your relationship with this God, little G. Cut it off. Lay it down and follow me, and we're going to have some fun. Now you're going to walk into the atmosphere of heaven where salvation now, now you're going to find out what your soul is really made for, to trust the provision of God, to move in the supernatural. Go ahead and leap. Leap off the cliff. Well, you know the story. That rich young ruler couldn't do it. He had too much at stake. Too much was riding on that decision. I can't let go of my script and of being in control of my life. I can't let go of this God little G. I've got a job to do. I've got a kingdom to rule. He was a ruler. He needed the economics to do good things. So he rationalized from a humanistic vantage point. He rationalized his economics and said, you know, I'm going to need this to rule in my kingdom. Jesus goes, oh, dude, if you would come into my kingdom, you'd have plenty of resources. Trust me where this came from. But he couldn't let it go. It says he walked away sad. He did not experience salvation. Salvation defined as being made whole. Prospering in your soul. Coming fully alive and being a spirit being. He did not experience that because he was holding on to this realm. Versus letting go and and coming into the other realm. And Jesus said it's going to be hard for rich people to come into the kingdom, harder than a camel going through the eye of a needle. And his disciples said something very profound, and they said, well, then who can be saved? Can anybody be saved? And what he means is, what they were saying is, we're all, at some standard or another, we're all rich. Yeah, that guy had a higher level of richness, 
But by all intents of standards, we're rich. So how can anybody get saved? And then Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. Meaning, I can so work on the hearts of men that are so addicted and so dependent on money. I can so liberate them from this fear, this clutching fear of mammon, that they can flow in the Holy Spirit. Who can be saved? Well, God will liberate you from fear to faith today. And you'll be saved. And you won't walk around uptight, afraid and worried, whether you're going to eat, what are you going to wear, how are you going to pay your bills, because there's a higher level of reality, a higher life source working with you. And that's true for your business. That's true for your personal life. It's true for everything. Trust me, in the end, beloved, it's not the government that's going to hold you up. Have you figured that one out? It's not even your bank account. At any given moment, the economy can come collapsing around us so fast it'll make your head spin. Do you honestly think you're safe, really, by your scheming and planning and manipulating and clutching and holding? Do you really, really think that you're in control? What a fantasy. What a farce. And Jesus comes along and says, listen, nobody's in control. Nobody's got that much power. Not even the richest among us. Don't be deceived. In the end, you're going to have to leap off the cliff with your little hang glider and trust in daddy. Because in the end, he's really the one that is feeding you. He really is the one clothing you. You just thought your hard work was doing it. You just thought all your control was doing it. You just thought your bank account was doing it. That is not true. If God wanted to cut you off, He could cut you off right now. You're operating under the grace and provision of God in every part of your life. And sometimes God has a holy dance with us. He withholds all this favor and blessing in order to get us to be aware that we're being held up by the wind of the Spirit and not our own ingenuity and cleverness. Oh, beloved, this this is a very exciting invitation. Very exciting. Every real conversion involves money and time and people and property. There's not a conversion that's real that excludes those four things. Now, in order to help the human race get over the hump and into the other realm, God created what I call a God gap. It's not, it's not only hard enough to get there, it's, he, made it even, he made a kind of a Grand Canyon leap to get from our world to his world. And he, the God gap, he set up a few God gaps. I'm, I'm talking about faith leaps. One of them is the Sabbath. Now, you and I take the Sabbath for granted, but actually the word means Shabbat, means, it means to rest, but it also means to let go. To let go of time, to let go. In that culture, at the time... They were surviving by the skin of their teeth. It was an agrarian culture of gathering and of hunting. I mean, it was brutal. Every day you went and scrounged around for a little food to make it to the next day, beloved, in that culture. They didn't have freezers and refrigerators. You tracking with me? They didn't have all this preserved food and canned goods and grocery stores. None of that. It was a... You know, subsistence living for most of them. And so when God comes early on in the history of his relationship with the human race, and he says, I want one-seventh of your time to be devoted to soaking in my presence, to being restored, and to let go of your control of time. I want a seventh of your time to be devoted to ministering to me. And that does not... That, that is an addition to personal prayer every day. And at the, in the Middle East, at that time, that was like violently radical. Because basically they were saying God has to supernaturally provide for not only that day, but the makeup day that we lost. 
And so the Middle Eastern culture around the Jews looked at them and thought, you people are crazy. You people are nutso. For you to put yourself at risk by taking one day off is the most ridiculous thing you could ever do. And they would say, God is our source. God is our source. God will provide. God said he wants us to give him a day to rest and to let go of control and being gods of this life. We're going to let go of being the gods of this world and trust in him. And sure enough, they populated beyond anybody else in the earth. And they still exist today. And not one of those ancient cultures are in existence today other than the Jews. How's that for amazing? And so the Sabbath was built into the commandments. That is as much an economic invitation as anything. It's, a, it's putting God at the center and, and first above all things as provider in life. We rest in the Lord. It's called the rest of faith in Hebrews. And the second one, uh, the second area is finances. The Lord, early on, before Abraham, before the Ten Commandments, he starts talking early on to tithing to the early, earliest of populations. And tithing was, it means 10%. And basically what he said is, I want you to take 10% of your crop and give it back to me as a thank offering, as a worship offering. Now people, that is about as irrational a thing as you could ever do. A seventh of your time, that's just one day a week, and not including the other times during the day, and 10% of your income giving to the Lord. Then he added offerings. We're not done tithes, and then offerings, and this was the basic beginning warm-up of walking with God in the early days. Again, they did not have remotely close to what we have in terms of provision and resource. I guarantee you, you have more clothes in your closet than what you're wearing. Right? How many, of, how many people that this is the only thing you own in terms of clothing? Raise your hand. Okay, I'm pretty safe. Well, you're way ahead now of the Middle East. They may have had one, perhaps two garments. That's it. They didn't have our kind of transportation. They did not have our access to food. They didn't have any of this stuff. They were leaping out into the air of heaven doing this. Now, Jesus comes along in the New Testament. You don't see a lot of reference to tithing in the New Testament because guess what? The New, Te- the New Testament was a completion and a fulfillment of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was types and shadows. They were just sort of um, props and visual aids to point to a higher reality. Do you follow me? And so in the New Testament, you don't see just them just, you know, p- taking a calculator and just, you know, doing it to the penny of chunking out 10% and then a little offering here and there. You see an incompletely radical statement. Jesus changed the rules, in other words. He upgraded the rules. For example, he says, look, if you commit adultery in the Old Testament, dude, that's sin with with someone else's wife. You actually have sexual intercourse with someone else. That's adultery. That's a no-no. And you can be punished for that. Now, in the New Testament, he goes, whoa, God's after the heart. If you even think lustfully about possessing someone, eros love, using them to fulfill your needs, that I consider adultery from the heart. That's just as bad. bad. Well, maybe not. Just as bad in terms of the consequences, but it's bad. It's really bad. So Jesus changed and upgraded the lifestyle that we get to have in this, this last days. So when you see the early church being engaged around the topic of money, it was they just took that... They took the tithe as the floor and not the ceiling. That was beginning level 101 walk with Jesus. And in many cases, they saw the kingdom so clearly that they would just turn everything over. Sell land, sell properties, give things. Why? Because they encountered a God of another realm. And they knew that where that land comes from, more is is right behind it. So Jesus said, if you leave father and mothers and brothers and sisters and lands and properties in my name, I will give you a hundred times more 
in the age to come and in this age. Don't worry about it. Now, don't be stupid, but don't worry about it. I am the God of miracles. Cooperate. Partner with me around this thing called money and property and time. Work with me here, and I will infuse a supernatural dynamic in it. I'll inject an elevated place, and you'll watch me do it. This is not legalism we're talking about here. This is not, again, pull out the calculator. Okay, here it comes. We're being, you know, we're being whipped on, you know, because the church is a little low on funds, and so they're having the, they're having the money talk. <laughs> that is so not the case. So not the case. We're talking about living as a peculiar people, as aliens in another realm. We're a peculiar people. That's what the Bible calls you, an alien You're a son of God. You're not of this realm. You're not of this planet. You're not a humanoid. You're a son of God. You're a new species. You're a new creation who lives by another operating system, another worldview, another lens, another source of power and life. So if we're still operating from the old world, you know, of finances and fear and nervousness, we're not operating as sons of God. And this isn't beating anybody up. This is calling us out of this corrupt thing, this worldly thing that we're all nervous about. Oh, gee, oh, gosh, oh, money, oh, no. And we're, we're moving from this intense, anxious world over into another world where we got a supernatural father because we're sons of God, daughters of God in a family, bringing the kingdom on earth. Now, this is, the, this is exciting when someone comes through, and I, I'm not going to use the term knot hole anymore because Mark Watson got a hold of me. He said, you're calling us through the knot hole of ourselves. No, I said, I'm calling you through the knot hole of self and into spiritual family where we lose control and we come into relationships where we don't belong to each other and we're, we're trusting God. He goes, that's not a knot hole you're asking, Tim. That's a black hole. And a black hole is so force. the power of it is so forceful that it obliterates it evaporates anything that exists. It, what does it do? It just explodes. The gravity, gravitational force is so intense, it just explodes us at a molecular level. Would you, would you say that's what a black hole does? Well, I'm, since I'm so studied in this area, Mark, I have such an authority to talk about the physics of the black hole. But I won't get into it today. I'll let you take the easy questions to Mark and... If he can't answer them, then I'll send you to PV. All right, so, do you tr- you tracking with me now? God wants to bring us from one realm to another. And in fact, if it hasn't hit your finances and your time and properties, it hasn't happened yet. You're still an old creation person. You're still loving me. You're not, you've not made it through the black hole. And to where God can reconstruct you as a son of God where you're hearing his voice and moving supernaturally. Beloved, this is where it gets fun. So God creates a gap. The Sabbath is one of those gaps. The tithes and the offering is another gap. It's a faith leap. Because in most of our lives, 10% plus offerings is like, you're kidding, seriously? Like how ever would I even get my electric bill paid if I started taking 10% of my income and giving it to the Lord? For real, for sure, Bro, are, you know, aren't you just being too literal? No, not even close being too liberal. Yes, question. Grosser net. Grosser net. I knew it was going to come. <laughs> Depends on if you're self-employed or not. <laughs> Am I letting you off? The way I figure it, he says, grosser net. Of course, the standard answer I'm supposed to give is, how much do you want to be blessed? All right, but that's not real helpful. The way I would say for most of us, most of you, unless you're self-employed and you have a business and and viable expenses to pay out of that business, the way I would say it is this. Take your pay stub, paycheck, and whatever 10% of that paycheck is, that's what you tithe on. And then if you get some return on your your taxes, pay tithe on that too. So I, I would say after taxes. Now, some of you say, no, not after taxes, you low level unbeliever. 
I'd say for most of you, if you could do that, you've pretty well leapt into the other world right now in your life. And there is room for growth in this area. For sure there's room for growth and trust. At this point, Jen and I, there was a couple of times, one especially, the Lord came to me and he said, I want you to be like the rich young ruler. And I go, Lord, I am tithing, double tithing. We're doing awesome. We're giving our lives to you. We're ministering to you. We're writing big checks. He goes, I know, but I want you to give it all away and follow me. And I mean, seriously, like my throat parched choke because we had a really nice nest egg and we had we had assets this was when we were younger and had two little babies two little kids and janet remember this time i come to her and said janet we're supposed to write big checks and give it all away and she's like a scott irish farm girl raised by people that went through the depression my mom went through the depression and up half of me is Scott Irish. It's McCorter. That's on my mother's side, McCorter. Okay, so I got stingy Germans and stingy Scott Irish in my blood. Janet's full out Scott Irish, Mahaffey, Arneal, whatever. And here we go. And God says, give it all away. And I thought I was, you know, having. Delu- I was getting delusional. I mean, I literally heard demonic torment came after me when I started engaging God at this level of economics. It was torment to my soul. I, I was like feeling like I was going mental. The fear that rose up inside of me started hitting. It was freaky. Then I said, God, please give me more grace. Please give me more grace. So he did. And then we wrote the checks and we... We moved into some duplexes in the, basically in the inner city off Truce with, next to Bickle. And we st- in a two-bedroom duplex that were built to last about 10 years during World War II for military people near Bendix. They were like little flimsy little card-barred duplexes. At, 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 we had been living in the suburbs in a beautiful home with a pool, with money, with a nice paycheck and a pension and retirement and all that and health care. And God says, give it all. Leave that security. Resign from all that. Give it all away and move into a duplex with your kids. I said, you, now you do know, God, I have two kids. So it happened. There we did it. Now, Since then, we were all making the same amount of income. I think we were making $18,000 or something like that. Our income almost went in half when we started working. Our income almost cut in half. You tracking with me? I had nothing. And so, I'm going, how is this going to work out? I'm telling you what. It was story after story, story after story, where after we left into the winds of the Spirit, where God began to provide. Things began to happen. Stuff started flowing in our lives. It was weird. Totally weird. And when we ended up leaving that church planting work to go out onto another season of learning to do be bivocational church planters, so we left there penniless. And we leapt out again. That was in 1992. We leapt out again without any real resources at all. I remember we were kind of depressed and discouraged, and we jumped in a car to go get some ministry up in Spokane from Kansas City. We stopped in the middle of a blizzard, and we had a full-out fight, Jen and I did, in a snowstorm, And because I, I dawned on me I didn't have enough money to get back. That was a stupid move, but I was so desperate to get some help in ministry, we took off... We got up there, they're ministering to us, they took an offering, $888, which means new beginnings, triple new beginnings, and it paid for our trip up and back, and it just worked out. From those places, two or three times in our life, God took us to those places of ultimate and maximum trust, and believe me, I was raised by heavy-duty financial planners. I started a life insurance policy with whole, it was called Extraordinary Life, with Northwest Mutual Life. I started a whole life policy at 19 years old 
And the cash values by the time I was in my 30s were worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Because my grandpa was the chairman of the board of the Indiana Credit Association. He sat down with me when I was 16 and when I was 17 and when I was 18. He goes, young man, you need to start getting life insurance. I go, life insurance? I'm not going to die. I'm never going to die because you never think you're going to die at 18. He goes, I'm not talking about your death. I'm talking about your life. And you have this annuity that you can borrow against at no interest because it's your money. You could be your own bank. And, the, and he began coaching me how to be my own bank at 19 years old. So get, you get my point. This was not just, I was not just doing this because I didn't have anything or know anything. I did it because I knew a lot and had a lot. And God asked me to deal with this. Be, deal with this. I didn't know until later that God was going to invite me into being an apostolic father. That means, that doesn't mean I get to canonize scripture, okay? That just means... It's an ascension apostle. It's a little gift. It's like the gift of pastor, teacher, whatever, where I'm called to help mobilize a generation to go to the nations and live by faith. And the Lord said, unless you've been exercised and practiced in trusting me for my provision, for your provision, you will have no credibility to impart this to a next generation. You'll have no stories to tell. I didn't know it at the time. He didn't clue me in that on the other end of this decision... You were going to be in front of me, and I was going to get to teach you on how to trust God for money. He just said, do it. All right, so now, now, here we are. Janet's 60. Sorry. They've got to know. And our properties, our cars are paid for. We own five properties that are being rented in Kansas City. And God's blessed us beyond imagination, our imagination. And we just keep writing those checks, writing those checks, sowing into other ministries, sowing into our, this church planting movement. We just keep writing those checks. And we live so simple, you would not believe it. But stuff is just, God has just propped us up supernaturally. And we intend to have him prop us up supernaturally for the rest of our life. And I want you to know that that's your privilege, that's your prerogative as a son of God to move with God like this. And it's going to start with the basics. Tithing, offerings. You tithe into your, the church that you're a part of, the, the vision that you're a part of, the people that you're a part of. Because the war chest, it's you're tithing to God, not to Josh Horick. You don't tithe to the rock, you tithe to the Lord and then we steward that. The elders steward that. We budget that. And we decide, okay, we prayerfully think through every penny because that's holy money. We don't get to squander. That's holy money. If we blow it, we're under judgment. And we create a budget and we fight and pray and we, we pray that out. Every time you write a check, you put that in the offering. You pray, God, is this a seed for new churches to be planted, for people to come into the kingdom, for people to get saved and out of hell and get, make disciples of the nations. That's what we're doing. Now, a couple more points, and I know it's getting chilly in here. Hang on. Can you hang on? The investment return ratio of giving is so disproportionately that it's almost laughable. In other words, Jesus said... He had likened your giving to a treasure hidden in a field. And he said there's this massive treasure full of, uh, you know, priceless gold, silver, jewels, whatever. And all you got to do to get at that priceless treasure is to buy this piddly little field. Get the piddly little field and you get the treasure that's worth phenomenally more than the field itself. So it's a smart business decision to go and buy the field and get to the treasure. It's a disproportionately high level of, an, of return on the investment. Does that make sense? That is always true for heaven. Because you store up, you store up treasure in heaven that moves into eternity. So you're cooperating with a bigger picture than just here and now. You're investing in 
that which will be into eternity. Uh, how many of you know that there was a civil war in this country at one time? Very good. And the, fought, the North fought the South. Do you know that the South created its own notes, its own financial me- medium of exchange? It had its own paper exchange, Confederacy notes. And then the Union had its dollars. Now, what would happen if, if the war was looking like it was coming to the end, you're a Confederate with a bucket load of money, you're a chest full of Confederate bills up in the North, and you know this thing isn't going well. This war is about to end, and there's a good chance my, my Confederate notes are going to be worth that much. I can start my fire with it, but that's it. I can't buy a thing with them. What would you do at that moment? Wouldn't you take them to a legitimate bank, which they, they could have, and convert those Confederate notes to Union dollars? How many of you think well, that would be a smart move? Of course you would do that. Because you're aligning with the winning side long term. Well, that's what Jesus is saying. Listen, people. There's not a thing that you own right now that isn't going to end up at some point full of rust and moths and in a garbage dump. I don't care how much you love your car. At the 500-year mark, it ain't going to be here. I'm sorry. I know you love those favorite jeans of yours. But at the thousand year mark, they're not going to be here. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's this realm is the Confederate <laughs> army and it's, and it's going to be changed dramatically and the kingdom, the kingdom realm is going to take over and be superimposed over the earth. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, a new economy, a new people. We're going to have dominion in this realm. Beloved, and that Jesus goes, it's just intelligent. Invest in the long-term win. You get that point? Okay. He also says that promotion comes to those who are faithful in a little in the area of economics. Look at Luke 16.10. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. And he said to them, You are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your hearts. What is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight. So what you do with money now determines your position, your role, and your level of responsibility in the age to come. Luke 16.10. All right, I'm going to close with some practical advice. There is so much to talk about this. So many miracles in store for you. I have so many miracle stories, and I bet you do too, many of you. I would love for us someday to stand and give miracle stories around money. Mono's got them. I've got them. There, there are stories so bizarre and so outrageous, there's only one explanation. It's the God of the universe, our Father, who did the providing. Beloved, this is a fun way to live. So here's some practical advice. One, first and foremost, switch gods today. Switch gods Fire the God of Mammon. You're fired. I didn't invent that. (laughs) Especially this God of money. He alone is your source of survival and security and wants and desires. Make God your source of life. Make Jesus your vision. Now Jesus said, if the eye gate... Remember that statement about the eye gate pinched between those statements about money? He said, if your eye gate is dark, everything will be dark. 
That's because people were gazing on what they wanted. They were gazing on money. You become what you look at. You attract what you long for. So the word of advice is gaze on the Lord. Gaze on Jesus. Gaze on the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. And what happens is as you gaze on the Lord, you pick up the attributes of heaven and you move from glory to glory. You become like who you look at. And in the area of money, even those worldly people know the laws of psychocybernetics. And they will say, put a picture of the Mercedes on your refrigerator and chant Mercedes, Mercedes, Mercedes. Go touch Mercedes, smell Mercedes, get into Mercedes. Give your heart to it. Start saving for your Mercedes. Because as you think, you will draw it and you will be, you know, the Mercedes will come to you. Guess what? It works. It's called witchcraft. It works. New age people, they understand visualization and imagination and the power of these things. And so Jesus is going, use your imagination, use your visualization to gaze on the Lord, to gaze on his kingdom, seeking first Jesus and the kingdom of God, and draw in the reality of Christ to your human spirit. And he says, as Moses gazed upon God and his face got a Shekinah glory, so you gaze on God and you will too move from glory to glory because you have no veil. And you can see the Lord and as you seek these things, you will begin to operate under the provision of God supernaturally. But you can't do that if you're preoccupied with money and loss, and fear, and nervousness. And the barometer of that is, the first level barometer is tithing. That's just a warm-up in the kingdom. Again, that's the floor, not the ceiling. So number one, switch gods. Gaze on Jesus, and give yourself fresh to him, particularly in the area of money. Second, get a budget. Now, I've got a little budget over there that you can get, and if when I get your emails, I'm going to send out a more in-depth packet for how you can begin to work with your finances. We have a serious problem in the church in America in the area of mismanaging money, and we do not want you enslaved. Okay, three, start tithing. Now, when you write your tithes, you write to Rock Laramie. You tithe, we tithe the Rock Laramie. And then Rock Laramie is actually, then we tithe up to um, uh, Kingdom Ministries International, which is another organization that helps cover us in the kingdom. But we, you make your tithe check to Rock Laramie. Rock Laramie has been started by Rock International. So sometimes you'll hear us say, make your check to Rock International. That would be an offering. And that would we would use to chart, start another church or to do some compassion things out of Rock International. Rock Laramie has a budget. And we're beginning to release Josh and Amy more full-time in leadership of Rock Laramie. It's very exciting. Because that way we can build more leaders, make more disciples, and multiply more churches. So Rock Laramie is where you tithe. You can give offerings to Rock International. Now Rock Laramie also gives uh, both... It gives finances to Rock International to help support our church planting work, and other things. So do you get that? Next, um, get out of debt. Get out of debt. We have a commitment to help people get out of debt. You're a slave to the lender. That doesn't mean debt is sin or evil. It just means you're slaved, enslaved by Massacard at 18% interest. That's not a good moment. I'd say another thing is, simplify your lifestyle. There's a lot of things you can do without that if you will simplify your lifestyle, get out of debt, and live well, you will have liberty to do things you never thought possible. Simplify your lifestyle. Learn to save and invest. I advocate a 10-10-80 plan. You tithe 10 or more, you save and invest 10, and you live on 80, but you can actually live on less than 80, especially if you learn to live in community. Some of you should learn to live in community. Don't go out to restaurants. Reduce your, re- your recreation and entertainment. 
Go hiking instead. Go skiing with Allison, whatever. But do something different that you don't have to spend money on because you're going to have just as much fun anyway. So simplify your life. Learn to save and invest. A car is not an investment. How many of you figured that out? Yeah, yeah. Mono says it's like toilet paper. It's very dispensable. That's pretty graphic, bro. It's not, a car is not an asset. An asset, it's losing money. It's depreciating all the time. It's costing you. You're not getting anything from it. It is not an asset. I recommend a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. An asset is what makes you money. It's passive income. So start thinking intelligently about money. And finally, never fall into unbelief. Get into the law of sowing and reaping. The law of reciprocity. It's a powerful verse, 2 Corinthians 9.11. It says, now he who, who supplies the seed. So God gives you the seed. God gives you the money. You didn't come up with it. God who gives you the money. He goes, he supplies the seed of the, to the sower and bread for food. Will also He will supply and increase your store of seed and he will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Okay, two books I recommend. One is The Treasure Principle. I'm going to hand out a copy of this book to all of our house church leaders today. And then I've got one or two extras, and I'll just see if you look hungry enough, and I might give you that. But um, if you look desperate enough, I might give you a copy of this. How desperate do you look? Mark, you look pretty desperate, plus you're a house church leader. So here you go, Mark. Oh. Andrew interfered. The second book, Michael just showed me this book. It's awesome. Money and the Prosperous Soul. The Prosperous Soul was made to move supernaturally in faith and not in anxiety around the topic of money. This is an awesome book written by by a CPA who's on staff at Bethel Church. And he talks about the supernatural relationship that you can have with God as it relates to money. It's an amazing book. I love this book, Michael. Thank you. All right? So I'm going to pray for you right now for a miracle. For you to go through this black hole out of one realm of mammon and the world and functioning like a, a worldly person or holding on to the Christian religion and, and inventing a new, a new model and moving into the kingdom. So would you stand with me? In particular, I really want to pray for those of you who have a fear around this topic and those are, that are younger. If you're under 40, again, raise your hands. Okay, that's good. That's exciting. Put your hands down. How many of you, this topic makes you super ner- nervous? Raise your hand. If, well, if you, it makes me nervous. Raise your, be honest. How many of you find this topic challenging? Good, good. Praise the Lord. Then you're being honest. I tell you what, this is when your life in Christ starts. When you start messing around in the area of money and hand it over to the Lord. Okay, here we go. Put your hands up. We're going to ask for the Lord to break down inside us. Father, break down inside us. I ask that you would come, Lord, with the power of the word of the Lord and release the gift of faith to this family that you would take us out of the Christian religion and some invention that we've come up with and move us into the the supernatural realm where we can relate to you, God, and trust you for money. Teach this church, Lord. Teach us how to be free of fear and how to trust you as our daddy. Show us how to tithe and give offerings. Lord, I pray, I pray for a miracle in this area. Come, my king. Come and do great things in our midst. I pray that in the next weeks and months and years, every person in this room will have a testimony of the surprising supernatural provision of God. Stories that give you glory. Come, Lord, right now. Come, Holy Spirit, now in Jesus' name and heat up our cold bodies.
Put the fire of God on us right now in Jesus' name. Receive this now, beloved. The ability to trust God for provision. Supernatural. Receive this supernatural gift. You young people, you've been called to be an apostolic people that go and trust God to take ground in other cities and other nations. How can you do this if you haven't resolved this topic of money? Today is the day to learn about this, to absorb it, and to grow into this reality. This is normal. Blessed be the name of the Lord.